All right, welcome. Today we're going to do chapter 20, and because I love you guys so much, this is what I'm doing. Obviously, the only thing worse than being caught at a COVID uh, stay-at-home order is a COVID stay-at-home order when our power is out. So as you can tell by the lovely background, we are now outside today uh, doing this because I love you guys and didn't want to miss any of this. So today we're going to do chapter 20, dealing with land use controls. <clears throat> it appears that my screen is breaking up. Is it looking okay? Thumbs up. All right. So we're going to deal with this chapter. And once again, I've made this comment and I'll make it again. This is one of those chapters that looks like at the very end they had some pa paper left and went, uh, let's talk about this. All right because I will tell you as an acting professional, you probably won't deal a lot in the land use controls out of the gate. Most of it's actually going to be uh, zoning issues and 80% of the time, 90% of the time, that's even not gonna be an issue, all right? So land use controls deals with the fact of how we use the land and the natural resources and all of that. First thing that you need to know is there are 2.43 billion acres of land in the United States. 60% of that land is privately owned and the rest is owned by the government. Of all that land that's left owned by the government, one third of it is in Alaska. All right, so that tells you how, much, how big Alaska really is. So typically what we're gonna talk about is how the government can control and if you remember the governmental powers one of them was the police powers and inside of the police powers was zoning was an example because this is how they protect the safety health and welfare of you from your neighbor it's not so much the man trying to hold you down it's more of them protecting you from the neighbor and the neighbor they're protecting from you all right so they do this in this thing called a comprehensive plan. A comprehensive plan is a plan that is created by a municipality, not a state, not a county, not a city. So for instance, Greenwood has a comprehensive plan and so does Bargersville, even though they're both in the same county, all right? And the comprehensive plan explains how the planning commission is going to use things like the natural resources, the traffic flow, how do they control population? Uh, what do they do with uh, environmental areas like wetlands? And the big thing about a comprehensive plan, now I have one, I have Greenwood's comprehensive plan. It is a long range plan. Their plan went from 2007 to 2027. It's a long range plan of how they're going to help grow the municipality of Greenwood. And in that, they talk about the traffic patterns. Where are they going to do with the traffic patterns and increase the flow? Like the road on the other side of 65, which is called Averett, I believe, you know, for instance, they plan for that to be all of those industrial buildings. They planned that 10 years ago, all right? So that's what the comprehensive plan does is it dictates how they're going to grow their city. And they do that through this thing called zoning, all right? So there on page 389, they're talking about zoning and they have what they call zoning ordinances, which control what you can do in certain areas. Now, most of us think about zoning to talk about what we can do. There's actually all kinds of different zoning that's allowed, all right? There's uh, usage zoning, which is the most common one that you guys know of. There's lot size zoning, there's density zoning, there's an aesthetic zoning, which we would call like a historic district. All of these zonings dictate what a person can do with their property. Now, over on page 390, they talk about different zoning classifications. 
and we've talked about these before. You've got things like agricultural, residential, commercial. And in the commercial zoning, they're usually talking about office and retail, all right? Because they break out industrial separately, mainly because of the environmental issues that they've got. And then there's that other one they called special use. Those are the things that they have one or two of in an area, like a government building or a cemetery or things of that nature. And then the last one, which is that asterisk zoning that we talked about once before, remember the planned unit development, which can combine all of those together so that a developer doesn't have to seek out individual zoning. He just seeks out PUD and can do multiple things in there. Now, when they grant or change the zoning, they use these things called a zoning ordinance. And the zoning ordinance will dictate by a certain area what's residential and a certain area what's commercial. And then inside of that is when people seek oh, I want C2 or C4, and we're not going to get into all those definitions in this course, all right? <clears throat> now, there have been many court cases, and don't try and challenge the government on this by saying, well, it's my land, I'll do with it what I want. No, the 14th Amendment, as we talked about, gives you the pursuit to happiness, and that comes out of the Fifth Amendment as well, but the reality is it's still there put in place for protection of your neighbors. It's so that your neighbor doesn't turn his house into a toxic waste dump. Because what would happen to the value of your home if your neighbor turns his house into a toxic waste dump? You're, it's gonna go down and that's not fair to you. So there is zoning in place to keep that happen. Now, here's where the big parts are going to come in on your exams. They do this and they put these zonings out in certain areas and you must comply with the zoning. If you want to change zonings, there are three different types of permits that we're gonna talk about today, all right? And this is where they key in on most of the, the knowledge here. Now, if you remember, we talked about those houses that were over there on 31 by the Hooters and the International House of Pancakes and you know 31's here. And we had those structures that looked like houses, but they were legitimately office buildings. So let's get that off the screen. They are in there, all right? But now you look at them and they're office buildings. So the first one I wanna talk about is this thing called a non-conforming use. So when you look at these four buildings here, what you see is one of them, there is still a person and there still is a person living in that building as a resident, all right? But here's the problem. Notice how that one property looks different or is being treated differently because they look like the odd man out when the reality is they were the original ones there and everybody else changed around them. So when the city came in and converted this strip of land to commercial, they granted this person what's called a non-conforming use. They granted them a non-conforming use permit. This allows that person to continue to operate as they were because they were there first. Think of it like the grandfather clause, all right? It's the grandfather clause. So even though it's zoned commercial in that area, this person can still live in their house because they were granted non-conforming use permit, which allows them to maintain that property as residential until one of two things happen. All right, if they sell their property to a, another commercial person, which now conforms, they would in essence lose that non-conforming use. That's one. Or if the house gets destroyed, 
by tornado, earthquake, whatever, and they fail to rebuild that house, it also will lose the non-conforming use. All right. So that's the first one is this non-conforming use permit is when the person looks like they're the odd man wrong, but they were there first and everybody else changed around them. And since you cannot live in a commercially zoned area, they had to be issued this non-conforming use permit. Now, let's change it slightly different. There's a second version of this, and these next two now, same drawing, but that one person looks different still. That is because that person actually sought out to change their property. And if you want to change your zoning, you have to go in front of the zoning board or the board of appeals and explain why you want to change your zoning. And they get to hear that court case. And also people get to come in what's called remonstrate and say, yeah, we want it or we don't want it or whatever. Okay. So the first one is what they call a conditional use permit. Suppose you have a house in a residential area, but you want to now have a daycare in the garage. You would have to seek out a conditional use permit to allow you to have that daycare in a residential zoned area. So once again, look at the picture. The one house that looks different, now in this case, they sought the change. That's why they are different. And in that conditional use permit, it would give them permission to have a daycare in their garage. Now, the problem with conditional use permits is two things. One, if they sell that house, that conditional use permit goes away. The next person doesn't automatically, when they buy the house, get that conditional use permit. Unlike the other one, the non-conforming use, she can still sell that as a residence and the next person can move in as a non-conforming use. The conditional use permit goes away. And when it's granted, it's only granted for one thing, daycare. She cannot change their mind and go, oh, now I wanna cut hair out of my garage. No, your conditional use permit was granted for a daycare. You cannot change that use without going in front of the Board of Appeals again and saying, hey, now I want to cut hair and go through the whole process again. All right. So understand that it's the same kind of drawing where one person looks like the odd person in the conditional use permit. They are the ones that sought out the change. In the non-conforming use, everybody else around them changed. They stayed the same, but yet they still look like the odd man out. Are we cool with that? Thumbs up. All right. Now, there's one other thing here that's called a variance. A variance is a modification of the zoning that it's already in place. Let me give you an example. Here's somebody's lot, right? Most building lots have what we call a setback variant or setback standard. You cannot build your house within 15 feet of the front of your lot. And that is in case they need to put a drainage ditch or a sidewalk or something of that nature. So they've got these setbacks virtually ensuring that you do not build your property on the edge of your lot. And that is for various reasons, all right? Now, suppose you wanna build a house, there's my house, but you need to add a garage that goes beyond that because you collect cars, for example. You would seek out a variance to change this distance here to something else. You're not 
getting a new use. You're just changing a standard that's in place. You are vary, varying it, all right? So that's called a variance. So what you have are three different ways to modify that. You could be granted a non-conforming use where everybody changed around you, or you can seek it out through a, a conditional use permit or you can modify a standard, but you're not changing the use. That is called a variance. All right. Now, I know that it feels like I'm flying through this, so I want to make sure that we're all okay. Are we cool so far? All right, great. Now, another one of the governmental powers was this thing that we talked about called building codes. A building code is a standard, an engineering standard of how a building must be built. You cannot say, well, geez, it's my land and my building. I want to build a building out of plywood. No, that is not safe for other people to come in. So they force a building code that says things like, oh, well, if your building's over 5,000 square feet, it's got to have an automatic sprinkler. If it's got multiple tenants, you got to have a wall between the tenants that will block fire for two hours. It's called a two hour firewall. Those are safety and health standards for other people coming into your building. Once again, they're telling you how to build your building and you will not get your building permit to build your building until it passes the code inspection. My cousin, Robin, is actually one of the code inspectors for the state of Indiana, and he knows what's being built because they have to <clears throat> submit the plans to him prior to him signing off and saying, yes, this meets the codes and it is safe for people to go into. So that is called the building codes. And every building that you have been in, including the school, had to pass the building code to get their building permit so they could literally build the building. Now, there is a very special set of building codes for the residential world. And when a builder builds a brand new home, before he can sell it the very first time to a consumer, it has to get passed by what's called and get a certificate of occupancy, a C of O, a certificate of occupancy. Basically what happens is the building inspector comes out and looks at this brand new house and determines that it is actually safe for a person to live in. Do the windows shut? Do the doors lock? Are the electrical up to code? Does it have heat and ventilation? All of these things the building inspector would inspect and then he'll sign off and give that builder this thing called a certificate of occupancy, which allows the builder to sell the house to this new home buyer. All right. It's a very specific set of building codes used in the residential world. It is only used one time, the very first time from the builder to the very first owner. From then on, we use this thing called a seller's disclosure from the first owner on down the line, all right? So that is the certificate of occupancy. It is a permit that is given to the builder. Now, like this land plan that the comprehensive plan uses, when a developer develops a subdivision, he too will create a subdivision plan so that everybody knows 
okay, here's where the retention pond's going to be. Here's the exit. Here's some sound blocking hills called uh, swales, sound swales. And here's where the lots are going to be like this. And here's, that's the road. And here's my lots. That will be a subdivision plan that dictates how they're going to build those houses. And it's very similar to the comprehensive plan that the community uses. Only this is for just that one builder and his subdivision land plan. And this is what gets recorded in the plat map that we talked about way back in one of those earlier chapters when we did the lot and block method. This is where it comes from, his land plan or his development subdivision plan. Wind's going crazy. I hope it's not blocking the microphone. And in that subdivision plan, they have these things called a density zoning. Density zoning is how they control the population. Anybody here live in Franklin Township? Franklin, one of Franklin Township's issues is they want very few people out there to keep it quiet and safe and all of that. Well, the problem that that creates is you then have very few people to pay taxes. So they have, and let's use an example. They have a density zoning of 2.4. What this tells you is this. There are only allowed 2.4 structures, houses per acre. All right. So if a builder comes in and buys 100 acres, how many houses could he build on that? If he can have 2.4 houses per acre and he only buys 100 acres, if you take 2.4 per acre times 100 acres, he could build 240 houses. All right. Was there a question? I heard somebody's microphone. No? Cool. So understand that that's how they control the density is by saying, well, with 240 houses, that's only going to put so many people in. If we get, if we made it, let's say we made it 3.4, now he could build 340 houses, but that extra 100 houses would cause our sewer system to not be able to handle it. So we would have to have new sewers. And now we've got more children, so we have to have another school. And we have to have a second fire department. So you can see why this density zoning is important in controlling the population because they know that they've got certain limitations on some of their natural resources. There was a developer who wanted to build a big housing addition down in Bargersville, but he couldn't do it not because he couldn't afford to build the properties, he more than could afford it. The fact was, Bargersville does not have a full-time fire department, and those new houses, like 1,500 of them, would have caused the community to have to increase taxes to build a fire station, to hire full-time firemen, and their sewer system couldn't handle that many new houses, so he could not even get the permits to build them. So he was actually limited by the utilities and the services offered by the community because they weren't prepared to grow that fast. 
That's how they control the zoning through density zoning. Thumbs up. All right. Now, this so far has been the man holding you down. We actually can do it to ourselves. We actually can limit some of our own uses to ourselves. And we've talked about this many times before. One of the ways that we can do it are through these things called a deed restriction. A deed restriction is when the builder puts restrictions on the lot that he sells to you for that new construction home. He may tell you, hey, I'll sell you this lot, but you've got to build a 5,000 square foot house and it all has to be brick with a finished basement. And he's doing that to preserve the value of the, your neighbor's property. And when someone builds next to you, he's making them do the same thing because it preserves the value of your property. Because remember, we use comps. We learned about the CMA the other day. So you want your neighbor's house to be similar to yours. So if it sells for 600, 700, 800, that's going to be a comp for your property that you're going to use. So we actually can do it to ourselves. Now, we can even take it one step further and we do it through what's called an HOA, a homeowners association. The homeowners association actually is something that's private that we do to ourselves to say, hey, we don't want picket fences or we don't want chain link fences. In the homeowners association that I had in my previous house, we could not have a barn or a shed as an outbuilding. If you wanted a barn or a shed, it would only be up against your house. That was something that was created and when we bought that new house, we had to sign off agreeing to the homeowners association. Okay, so we've got deed restrictions, we've got covenants and conditions, and we've got homeowners associations. So we actually do it to ourselves on top of the zoning permits that we have to fall inside of. So once again, it's just more times that I've told you here we are, keep reducing our uh, control of the property. And you guys thought I was joking when I told you the rest of the book, we're just talking about how we take them away. This takes away some of your rights. You can't just go into a residentially zoned area and go, oh, I want to build a strip center. No, nope. zoning is going to have something to say about it. Now, there's one last thing in this chapter and it's called the Interstate Land Sales Full Disclosure Act. The first thing is, this is one more thing in this chapter that they're like, hey, let's throw this in. Now, for the Interstate Land Sales Disclosure Act to actually take effect, there have to be two things happen. One is they have to be unimproved lots. Unimproved. What does unimproved mean? Remember improvement meant man-made? So an unimproved lot is probably more what we call a vacant lot. So for the land sales disclosure to happen, you actually have to be selling vacant lots. And the second thing is across state lines across state lines. So if you're selling vacant lots to people inside of your state, this doesn't count. <clears throat> this is was designed to inhibit or stop these unscrupulous investors from selling Oceanside property in Arizona to a retiring couple out of Minnesota, right? Certainly no unscrupulous investor would ever do that. So if you're selling vacant lots across the state line to buyers across the state line, 
you have to create this report and submit it to HUD. And this report shows, in fact, that these lots do exist and certain where they at compared to shopping and where are they at compared to uh, other amenities like the airport, interstates, where are the new nearby communities, schools. That way, this person that's sitting out of state can get this report from HUD and verify that the lot they're planning on retiring and building on in Arizona actually exists and the person is not trying to con them. Thumbs up. Cool. Now, like any other government rule, there are some exceptions to this. And here are the exceptions to this report that has to get filed. The first exception is if the developer is selling less than 25 lots, this report's not required. If they're only selling one or two, they are exempt from filing this report. That's the first requirement. The second requirement is if each one of the lots are actually bigger than 20 acres, let's make sure we do this here. If the lots are greater than 20 acres, the assumption here is that a person is knowledgeable in buying real estate and they won't be conned. Okay, so if they're selling unimproved lots across the state line, they must fill out a report with HUD. If they're only selling less than 25 lots or the lots are bigger than 20 acres, that report is exempt. My theory is this, if you're only gonna cheat a few people or you're gonna cheat them really hard, that, that would be why it's exempt. All right. The best answer I can come up with is if you're selling less than 25 lots, the report is probably so expensive that it was not beneficial. And like I said, if you're buying a lot that's greater than 20 acres in size, you probably are well versed in what you're doing. So therefore, you don't need this report. All right. Now. I know that this was a very short chapter and this is not a well represented chapter in the state. But one of the things that's important is remembering the density zoning because there's probably gonna be a math question to figure out how many acres. And there's also going to be some questions about your non-conforming use, your conditional use and a variance. So make sure you understand the three differences in those. And I have heard that they love these two exemptions when asking about the Interstate Land Sales Full Disclosure Act. All right. Are there any questions with this chapter? No? Well, I wanna thank you guys for putting up with me today in this outside environment. And I just wanted to let you know, I didn't wanna not do it because I love you guys so much. So here's what we're gonna do. We'll see you guys later, all right? Bye.